This is Eric Strong from Stanford University. This is the first video in a five video series on pulmonary function tests. Very briefly, this series will begin with an introduction to pulmonary function tests, or PFTs. Next, I'll discuss spirometry, including flow volume loops, then lung volumes, including the techniques used to measure them. The fourth video will discuss the interesting test of the lungs diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide, abbreviated DLCO. Finally, the series will end with a brief summary, along with some practice cases that will also incorporate some clinical history and chest x-rays to help integrate PFT interpretation into a broader understanding of the pathology of the pulmonary system. The specific learning objectives for this introduction will be to know the general purpose of PFTs, to know the different types of PFTs, to know the three major categories of chronic diffuse lung disease, and finally, to understand the various subdivisions of the lung volume. Let me start by asking, what are the purposes of PFTs? What are the general reasons that would lead a clinician to order them? First and foremost, they can be used to diagnose symptomatic disease. This is, by a large margin, the most common reason to order them. Typical symptoms or signs that might trigger PFTs would be chronic dyspnea or cough, or unexplained hypercapnia or hypoxemia, particularly if any of these develop in a patient at increased risk of lung disease, such as smokers and those with occupational exposures. However, PFTs can also be used to screen for early asymptomatic disease in patients at high risk, for example, patients on long-term amiodarone, which has significant pulmonary toxicity. PFTs can also be used for prognostication of known disease. Along similar lines, they can be used to estimate surgical risk and likelihood of favorable outcome in some specific circumstances, such as lung resection in patients with COPD. Finally, they can also be used to monitor response to treatment, though most pulmonary diseases are best monitored by symptoms. Since diagnosis of symptomatic disease is why PFTs are usually ordered, that will be our subsequent focus. As a diagnostic tool, PFTs help classify diffuse lung disease into one of three broad categories. First is obstructive lung disease. This includes COPD, which means anything on the chronic bronchitis to emphysema spectrum, asthma, bronchiectasis, which is an irreversible dilation and destruction of the bronchial tree leading to chronic infections, and last, cystic fibrosis. The second category is restrictive lung disease, which includes interstitial lung disease, chest wall pathology, obesity, and neuromuscular disease. Finally, is pulmonary vascular disease, which includes primary pulmonary hypertension and chronic thromboembolic disease. For those viewers who already have some prior knowledge of PFTs, inclusion of pulmonary vascular disease in this discussion may seem unexpected since classic teaching of PFTs usually omits this last category. However, as will be discussed in the fourth video on DLCO, pulmonary vascular disease can display a specific abnormal pattern on PFTs of which one should be aware. Remember also that these categories are not mutually exclusive. For example, COPD can present with both obstructive and vascular findings on PFTs, and sarcoidosis, while classically restrictive, can present with any combination of all three. What are the actual functions of the pulmonary system that are tested by PFTs? PFTs actually provide information about every component of respiration. It tells us about the patency of the airways, both large and small, about the parenchyma, including both the alveoli and interstitium, the pulmonary vasculature, the bellows and pump mechanism that is actually responsible for the changes in intrathoracic pressure that cause air to move in and out of the lungs. This includes both the diaphragm and the chest wall. Finally is the neural control of ventilation, that is, is the brain telling the lungs to breathe as frequently and deeply as it should? In order to test all of these things, there are different types of PFTs. 
I conceptually divide the types of PFTs into two categories. This is not any type of official classification, just my own way of thinking about them. First are the standard PFTs. This includes spirometry, which is predominantly a measure of airflow. There are lung volumes. And there is the DLCO, which is largely a measure of the integrity of the alveolar capillary membrane. Typically, when a physician, nurse, or respiratory therapist mentions the term PFTs, this set of three tests is usually what he or she is referring to. In the absolutely most general sense, spirometry is responsible for diagnosing obstructive lung disease, lung volumes are responsible for diagnosing restrictive lung disease, and the DLCO, in conjunction with other tests, is responsible for suggesting the possibility of pulmonary vascular disease. In addition to the standard PFTs, there are also specialized PFTs. These are tests that can be done either in the PFT lab or at the bedside, usually the latter. Each of these is fast and inexpensive and typically used in one or two specific scenarios. There are arterial blood gases or ABGs, which is the topic of an entirely other video series in this channel. Exercise oximetry refers to measuring someone's pulse oximetry at rest and with modest activity. This is a quick and cheap way to pick up mild subclinical lung disease. For the six minute walk test, the patient is simply asked to walk as far as possible during a six minute period. This is not helpful for the diagnosis of any specific disease, but it can be used for both prognosis and to monitor response to treatment. The bedside peak flow is a measure of the maximum expiratory airflow that can be delivered in a single breath typically used to gauge the severity of an asthma exacerbation. Finally, maximum inspiratory and expiratory pressure can provide a rough estimate of diaphragmatic strength in neuromuscular disease, including predicting risk of respiratory failure during exacerbations, such as an impending myasthenic crisis. A topic that will come up repeatedly during the remaining videos is how the lung volume is divided up into different parts. Let me illustrate this. We'll plot the volume of air within the lungs as a function of time. And let's start off with a person breathing comfortably, not doing anything special, just sitting still, breathing. The volume of air exchanged during each resting breath is called the tidal volume. While it may feel to the person that he or she is moving a significant amount of air, you can see that as a fraction of the total air contained within the lung, this is actually just a small fraction. Imagine the patient is then specifically instructed to inhale as deeply as possible. The amount of volume the person has now inhaled above the normal tidal volume is called the inspiratory reserve volume. The patient is now asked to breathe out as completely as possible. The additional volume exhaled beyond what is exhaled during normal breathing is the expiratory reserve volume. And finally, when every last milliliter of air that can be squeezed out of the lungs has been, the volume of air that is still left inside is called the residual volume. While these are the four divisions of our lung volume that add up to our maximum possible lung volume, we typically don't consider the individual divisions during PFT interpretation as much as we consider specific groupings of volumes. These groupings are called capacities. For example, the inspiratory capacity is the sum of the tidal volume and the inspiratory reserve volume. The functional reserve capacity is the sum of the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. The vital capacity is the tidal volume plus the inspiratory and expiratory reserve volumes. And finally, everything added together is called the total lung capacity. I appreciate that these eight terms seem more numerous than necessary, and seem easy to get confused. That will become even more true once we start referring to all of them by their acronyms. All I can say is that I'm not personally responsible for the terminology, and you will really need to be able to use most of these terms fluently to have a solid understanding of PFT interpretation. Before concluding this first video, I wanted to show you an example of a PFT report 
so that you have an idea of where the next three videos will be taking you. Here's what a one-page PFT report might look like. This may seem a little intimidating, especially if you've never seen one before, but I'll be covering what most of these numbers mean. You can see that the values are reported as a percentage of that predicted given the patient's age, gender, and height. What's considered normal varies a little between different physiologic parameters as well as between different PFT labs. In general, a measurement is considered normal if it falls within 80 to 120 percent of the value predicted for that patient, or if it falls between the 5th and the 95th percentile for patients of identical age, gender, and height. In the US, my impression is that most clinicians prefer the former definition of normal range over the latter for most parameters. In terms of the actual components of the report, the top third is the spirometry, where the key measurements are the FVC, FEV1, and the FEV1 to FVC ratio. Also measured during spirometry is the patient's response to inhaled bronchodilators. And this little shape is the flow volume loop, which will be covered in the next video. The second third of the PFT report is the lung volumes, of which the TLC, or total lung capacity, is the most important. Finally, the last third is the diffusing capacity, or DLCO. That concludes this introduction to PFTs. The next video will discuss spirometry and the flow volume loop.